move on to our uh, next speaker and a, a personal friend of mine entering our 20th year of friendship. Um, and certainly someone that I've looked up to in our um, uh, support of the Hurricane Center and just public service and emergency communications in general. And I'm happy that he's still with us and hope he's, you know, the public service of the Hurricane Center uh, amateur radio stations, 44 years. And you could do another 44, right, Julio? <laughs> Anyways, but hopefully for many more years. And I'll, without further ado, I'll introduce Julio Rapol, WD4R, Assistant uh, Coordinator for the WX4NHC amateur radio station. Rob, and uh, th thank you, John, for an excellent presentation and all your support, and also uh, Canadian Bob, as we call him. And uh, basically, uh, my name is Julio Rapol. My call sign is WD4R, Whiskey Delta 4 Romeo, and I'm the amateur radio coordinator for WX48 NHC at the Hurricane Center. So, my presentation is about amateur radio at the Hurricane Center. And uh, we couldn't have done all of this without the special help of uh, Rob, KD1CY, and of course, our friend Jim Palmer, who is behind all the cameras and all the technology there that's going on. And they've been with us for at least 20 years that I know of. So remember during the coronavirus pandemic, when it was so quiet in the Atlantic, well, then we had 2023, which actually was just above average. And it was actually the fourth most active Atlantic hurricane season in history. And John, you might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I got that from somewhere. <laughs> anyway, but uh, fortunately, most of these, if you can see, ended up being fish storms. So we were very fortunate about that. And then, um, we had all of these storms come up, and the worst one, of course, there were two of them, Otis, and uh, of course, uh, Idalia as well. And they had 20 named storms, seven hurricanes, and three of them reaching uh, major hurricane strength. Hurricane Idalia made landfall in northern Florida as a major hurricane. At one point, it reached category four. And uh, our colleague, Rick Palm, uh, K1CE, is going to present a firsthand report of his experience and his damages during Hurricane Idalia. And 2024, we're going to have uh, all these cyclone names, and hopefully we won't pass William, but according to some of the predictions with La Nina, uh, we may be busier than that, but... Uh, I'm very grateful we're not going into Greek names, which don't follow the uh, English alphabetical order. That confused the heck out of us back when we used all the Greek names. But even after 10, 20, 30 years without a hurricane making landfall on a coastal area, it only takes one major hurricane and it'll change your life. This is Hurricane Michael in the Florida Gulf Coast in 2018. And you can see some of the damages are just completely life-changing uh, for many people. So even uh, if the hurricane season is not super active, you always have to monitor, especially the slow-moving storms that can have rapid intensification. And you can see this one here, which was Eon. So make sure you have a hurricane plan and an assistant that can help you put up your shutters Buy your supplies before the panic sets in, especially your spam. Prepare for the worst. You never know what could happen. And don't forget some of the stuff that can become very scarce when there's panic. Okay, so who we are and what do we do? Well, we started on the sixth floor of a high-rise building back in the 1980s after moving from the University of Miami across uh, the street, which was called A1A. And you'll notice we were on the sixth floor because it's the only floor that had hurricane shutters. Who would have thought that that would have protected just one floor? Well, we found out later. So in 1980, Dr. Neil Frank was interested in setting up a ham radio station because he heard that ham and radio operators communicate to the Caribbean even when power goes out or telephones go out. We didn't have internet back then. 
So he went and called the university and he says, do you have a ham radio operator there? And I just happened to be living in the UM dorm and I had a ham radio. So I would carry my ham radio in a cardboard box across US-1, known as A1A, and bring it to the hurricane center. And our first hurricane, um, you can see us there and Dr. Neil Frank hovering behind me, asking me what the heck am I doing, but anyway. We got through it and a few years later, we modernized our ham radio equipment and built a very nice communications box, which we called the Go Kit. And I explained to Dr. Frank, I said, yeah, in case the hurricane center is hit directly, we can take that and go, you know, and take it anywhere we need to. Well, the Go Kit weighed over 200 pounds and never went anywhere. <laughs> so. And you'll see all the wires and uh, all the uh, hurricane specialists there were always questioning, why do you need so many wires? So I had to explain to that. But then in 1992, there was a hurricane named Hurricane Andrew that hit us directly, or almost directly, uh, Category 5, and it just made a mess of the hurricane center in that building, which was called Gables One Tower at that time, 12-story building. So the government, with all their wisdoms, thought, well, maybe the hurricane center should be in a hurricane-proof building. Wouldn't that be, you know, wise to do? So in 1995, they built a hurricane-proof building, which can withstand a Category 5. It has 10-inch thick steel-reinforced concrete walls. And there's two rooms that have 20-inch thick steel-reinforced concrete walls that can withstand a tornado, and they're called bathrooms. So if you see everybody running to the bathroom, you know what's headed your way. So that year happened to be one of the busiest years on record as well, and we had a crew that put up seven antennas, ran several hundred feet of coax cable. Uh, since I'm very small, I was one of the volunteers that crawled under the access flooring to pull the cable through. And that was our first season at the Hurricane Center. You can see it's a fantastically designed building and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a volunteer there and I happen to be an architect and I happened to review some of the plans that they were considering at that time and had a little bit of input and uh, it really came out very nice and uh, it's been through several hurricanes uh, that went directly over us. Katrina was one, Wilma was another one and it did very well. So we modernized from the old Yezu FT-101 tube radio that we had back in 1980. Um, and now we have a more modern system, which is all solid state. And it's a Yezu FT-1200 and an amplifier which runs 600 watts. And 600 watts sounds like a lot, but it's not too bad when you can reach all the way across the world with a wire antenna. So we also use VHF and UHF radios, and everybody says, well, that, what can you get on a VHF or UHF? A couple miles, maybe? Well, we have systems set up that are linked repeaters. One is called SARNET, which is a statewide system that links, I believe, is 27 repeaters from the Florida Keys all the way up to North Florida to Tallahassee, and most of the EOCs are on there. So when there's an emergency, whether it's hurricanes or anything else, you can get on that frequency with a special tone and activate that system. We also have digital modes that we use, and one of them is our friend Rob and Jim, which do the Echolink IRLP mode, and we also use a thing called WinLink, which is email over ham radio. So it's email that is not necessarily through the internet, it goes in tones through the atmosphere, comes down, you have a receiver that converts those tones into an email, so you print it out on a computer. To most people, it just looks like an email. But if the wires go down, the internet goes down, we can still get through. And so this is our group there. Um, we had at one time 33 operators, um, and some of them have moved away, some of them have passed away, but and we're recruiting new uh, operators and it's not easy to do <clears throat> because you have to have a federal background check and you have to go through special training at the hurricane center so we're trying to recruit a few more people there 
and you can see how we get on the air. And sometimes we have as many as three or even four operators at one time, depending on where the hurricane is and how active it is and how many reports we're get, getting in. Uh, we have been on the air since 1980. We have worked over 100 hurricanes and we have clocked several thousand hours of, of our time there trying to gather those reports from the surface. And uh, 2020 was a very different year. Uh, we were in the middle of the pandemic and that was the first time ever we tried to go 100% remote. And we were concerned about that and about uh, the accuracy and the, and, 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 and the activity. And it, surprisingly enough, it was very successful. We had our operators working from their home station and were able to connect to the nets that we use, like the Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Net. And the other hams did the same thing. And we were able to relay all that information back to the Hurricane Center. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was handpicked by Dr. Neil Frank because I was the only ham in the dormitory across the street with a, with a radio I could bring. <laughs> and it was supposed to be a two-year appointment. And, uh, uh, we've been there 44 years, uh, 12 Hurricane Center directors, and uh, you know we really appreciate the Hurricane Center uh, for them welcoming, welcoming all the ham radio operators. And uh, our new director, Dr. Michael Brennan, is fantastic. He uh, is a great supporter of amateur radio, and he understands the importance of surface reports and how that brings in eyewitness reports and data that they can't get through other sources like Air Force Reconnaissance, Hurricane Hunters, or Satellite. This time you get reports like, uh, just give you one example, uh, Hurricane Fabian through the uh, Bahamas. Uh, the hand we were talking to there had lost his weather instruments. And I remember asking him, I said, well, can you see out the window? You know, what do you see? And he came back, he says, well, I'm looking out the window down the street and three houses have floated off their foundation or in the middle of the street. I said, oh, you just had a storm surge. So those kind of things, it may not be hard data, but it gives them a picture of what's actually happening on the ground. And John, we really appreciate your support and uh, your career at the Hurricane Center. I believe you started as a specialist in 2009, so we're very grateful that you're here and that you presented and that we're part of your team. So we'll briefly our purpose and goals to collect weather data, which we call surface reports from the affected area. And, and we do that in real time and we filter it and we give it to the hurricane specialist and that way they can see what's happening in real time. Provide backup communications for the hurricane center. I mean, it has happened a, a couple times where we were the only communications between us and like uh, NWS Slidell during Katrina and some of the other ones like in Brownsville. And then we provide the hurricane advisories over ham radio, which is really through the help of the Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Net to areas where they may not have internet. And uh, one good example was we had a hurricane hitting the Yucatan and there was a Mexican ham there and he was receiving the hurricane forecast through ham radio and relaying it to the only AM broadcast station in that area. That's the only communications they had with a little transistor AM radio and they were getting the data first through ham radio. So there's a lot of things we do and it's relayed and that helps people in the affected area. And then enhancing and promoting the accuracy and availability of weather uh, data surface reports and we encourage hams and non-hams to get weather stations, calibrate them and send us reports. Our ma main mission is to help save lives. So how can ham radio operators help during hurricane season? Well, here's a, a little flow chart that shows you all the many different ways you can send a report to the hurricane center. We are in the center because we collect the reports from many different modes, frequencies, and, and different agencies, and bring it down and then put them in for the hurricane specialist to review. And on our website, you'll see that we have listed our frequencies 
and our data modes, et cetera, and our website. And you can send things through the uh, internet as well if you're, if you're not a ham. Um, uh, we're very uh, appreciative for the Hurricane WatchNet. Um, they started back in 1965. And uh, the net manager, Bobby Graves, is here to give you more details of how the Hurricane WatchNet operates and how it operates with the Hurricane Center. And another important net that we use, and remember, we're, we're basically like, like the mailman. We sit there, we collect the mail, but then all of these networks, which some networks have more than 50 ham radio operators across the world, they relay the information back to us. And one of them is the VOIP net. And VOIP is a digital radio hybrid net that combines different sources of radio. And uh, it could be through Echolink, IRLP, uh, All Star, D Star. I mean, they have all these different modes. And we are limited in staff, limited in equipment. We have seven antennas. We can't do it all. So they do it. And they collect it all. And then they send us their reports. And uh, Rob uh, Macedo, KD1CY from New England, uh, is very supportive. And he's going to present a lot of detail about how they work. And just one brief example. Uh, in 2004, we had Hurricane Ivan that hit the Grenada Islands, and we had a ham. His name was uh, Clem from St. Lucia, which was nearby, and we were on 40 meters, which is a short wave frequency, 7 megahertz. We could not hear the islands, but he heard them. So he was on the 40-meter net in St. Lucia, took the reports, relayed it over digital radio to the VOIP net, who then relayed it over to us. So it was relay after relay after relay, and it got here. Uh, another method is also um, APRS and CWOP, which is basically amateur radio operators with weather stations and also amateur weather enthusiasts, which are not hams but have a weather station connected to the internet, and they can send their data to NOAA, Mesonet, and we monitor those as well. So uh, surface reports are very important, but whatever you do, we don't want you to risk your life or get injured trying to collect a wind report in the middle of a hurricane. I don't know who that fool was, but anyway. Uh, we also collect reports directly over the internet. So let's say you're a ham, you got a report uh, you know, from the Dominican Republic or something, you can enter it yourself digitally here, and it's printed out directly at our station. We review it and give it to the hurricane specialist. And then we encourage everybody to download and print out the hurricane uh, surface report form. You can use it as a form, but at, the, at least you can see the format that we use to report surface reports and also what data we need. We don't just need wind reports, but it would be good to have wind, wind direction, barometric pressure, and other observations. And what is important to one person could be even more important for the hurricane. And one example was uh, one of the hurricanes that hit Mexico. We had a Mexican ham that was working at a scuba dive shop and he was right on the river and the inlet, and he reported that the water flow of the river had reversed and was starting to go upstream. And right off the bat, when the hurricane specialists saw that, they said, what's gonna happen is when that water meets the other water coming down, it's gonna be a massive flood. And in fact, it did happen, and they issued an advisory on that. Uh, other modes, uh, D-STAR and D-RATS, believe it, and D-RATS is a digital form. Um, we get some reports that are relayed to us. Now, we don't have those capabilities directly here, but there are several people who monitor that, and they send it to us. And, of course, WinLink, which is uh, HF digital email, basically. And uh, one example was uh, 2005 Hurricane Adrian, uh, when Dr. Rignab was there, we were getting these reports from a sailboat which was at harbor. And 
they did not have any other surface data along that area of uh, Central America. And I remember he called me and he says, can you get that sailboat to download their entire data from that weather station? So I asked for it, and that ham in that sailboat was able to do that and send it via HF email, WinLink, and we got that. And I'll never forget, uh, Dr. Nab called me, he says, if it weren't for that data, we may have had that hurricane landing in the wrong country. That's how important that information was, which we didn't know at the time. So can ham radio make a difference? And is ham radio too old? And uh, we, we make a lot of the hurricane advisories. You can see there after we listen for many hours and get just a handful of reports. And, but sometimes those few reports become very important as uh, Hurricane Special Stacy Store put in that advisory. So a little history, our first hurricane, Allen, 1980, hit the island of St. Lucia and we were the only ones in contact with the island uh, of St. Lucia, and they were damaged severely, and they had a lot of uh, medical emergencies, and they, that operator, ham, we had one op, ham operator left, uh, went on uh, the Hurricane WatchNet and called for medical assistance. There was the British hospital ship HMS Glasgow, who was nearby, and says, we can be there in less than a day, but we need permission from the government of St. Lucia because St. Lucia got independence from England. And so the Hamel radio operator was able to get the prime minister of St. Lucia on the radio who gave permission to the hospital ship, the British hospital ship directly. I mean, this is something that if it wasn't for ham radio, who knows what would have happened. Later on, that same hurricane hit Brownsville uh, Texas and the NWS office in Brownsville lost all communications and the only communications left was ham radio and Dr. Frank spoke with Brownsville for hours that night as it made direct landfall on Brownsville. Uh, another example is Hurricane George 1998 when it was exiting Haiti. The eye had become a little cloudy. It was at night Cuba was not allowing any Air Force reconnaissance or hurricane hunters over their airspace. So they didn't know exactly how the track was going to be influenced, you know, coming off of Haiti and going into Cuba. And there was a hurricane special, his name was, uh, and he was a Cuban, Lixian Avila, I don't know if you remember him, an excitable person. He came into the radio room. He says, Julio, get me the most eastern ham radio operator in Cuba, and I want to know what the wind's like over there. So I got on the air, and I got special permission to get on a frequency, which was the Cuban civil defense frequency. And I said, we need this information. And luckily, because I told him, I said, there's no way we can pick where we, our signal lands all over the place, hundreds, thousands of miles. We can't pick a location. By coincidence, there was the Cuban ham operator in Punto Este, the most eastern city in Cuba. And he came back and he's screaming over the microphone that he's standing on his chair because there's water in his house. And he said, you know, the wind was about 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. And Lixian would say, I don't care about the strength, the direction. So I asked what the direction, and the last three words from that ham was del sur, del sur, del sur, from the south. Lexian ran out of the radio room, and I'm like, what the heck did just happen? I have no idea. Then at the 11 o'clock news, I see Max Mayfield being interviewed, and he had my report in his hand. And he said, because of this ham radio report, we know, now know that Hurricane George is not going to go south toward Guantanamo. It's going to go north of Cuba. And the track was accurate. And so one more story, <laughs> Hurricane Michelle. Uh, <clears throat> we were getting reports of flooding from the Isle of Youth in Cuba. And there was this ham who was also in the military. And I thought, I said, you know, you're sending us military radar 
coordinates for the eye and all that. I said, you're going to get in trouble. He says, no, I'm not going to. He didn't. I don't know how that happened, but he didn't. And he was sharing that information with the Hurricane Center because we were sharing information to everybody. Like I've said before, Ham Radio has no borders. We're here to help people no matter where they are. And so that helped with the tracking. And then after it crossed Cuba, uh, the eye had opened up on the southern part of the eye and they were gonna downgrade it. And the Met Office in the Bahamas says, we're, we're gonna stop issuing hurricane warnings. But we had a sailboat docked that had, I believe it was a Rayathon weather station on board, was sending us uh, wind reports that were still over 100 miles per hour. And Max Mayfield came in here, he says, where are you getting these reports? And I showed him, he talked to the captain of that sailboat, and then he says, he called the med office in the Bahamas and says, maintain your hurricane warnings. Because although the radar shot shows the cloud covered over and the opening of the eye in the south so showing that it's decreasing in strength, something I didn't know was the mass of the wind which may not be detected with a satellite, is still rotating fast enough to cause those winds. So that was one of the influences there. And then, of course, one of the ones I went through was 1992 Hurricane Andrew. And uh, <clears throat> I was one of the 300,000 homes that were severely, severely damaged. I lost half of the roof of my house. And then uh, we had over 200 hams in Southern Dade County that are vol were volunteering to help communications, not just with local uh, police and fire and EOC, but also with the military and coordinating uh, helicopter reconnaissance and things like that. And that was our big one and it only took one and we had no hurricanes really affected us for 30 years before that. And uh, that's something that is a landmark for S South Florida. And another big one was uh, the, the one that hit the Big Easy New Orleans, Katrina 2005, the deadliest hurricane since 1928, the Florida Okeechobee hurricane. And Katrina killed 1,833 people, mostly because of the flooding and cost $108 billion in damages. And you can see, and the, you know, there's a lot of uh, stories about why they think that flooding happened, whether it was the levees or other factors or a combination thereof. So we were in constant communications with um, the NWS station in New Orleans and especially Slidell and headquarters had called into the hurricane center. They had lost all other communications they had no satellite communications. The satellite dishes had blown away. Um, and so they had a ham radio. One ham radio operator was there. And he had battery backup and a wire antenna. And uh, we connected to him and talked to him for six hours and got live reports of wind and damage. And you can see some of the handwritten reports that we had collected there, which became important. And especially the 41 staff members there after the hurricane had passed because they were all blocked in by the fallen trees and debris and communicated to their families that they, that they were okay. <laughs> so anyway, during that time, we had a famous NBC reporter that had come in and was doing a special because he had heard what Ham Radio had done. And he says, well, you guys are a bunch of dinosaurs been around for a hundred years you know don't we have anything better I'm going like well when you're in Bermuda in the middle of a category four hurricane go outside use your satellite phone and call me and he became a fan so uh, we had an interview that would describe some of this about us being dinosaurs with the Weather Channel, Dr. Rick Nab and Mike Bettis, who, who coin, coined a, f a phrase which I'll never forget. So I'll show you this short video here which describes why 
we may be dinosaurs. Well, when hurricanes knock out power, telephone lines, cell tower, sometimes going old school is the only way to get out the message. And sometimes those messages come straight from the National Hurricane Center, where they have their own radio team. And Julio Ripoll joins us right now. Uh, Julio, thanks for being with us. You know, this is a unique set up a unique relationship that amateur radio operators have with the hurricane center tell us how it works well uh, thank you mike oh, basically what we do here is we talk to other ham radio operators that are being affected by hurricanes sometimes right in the middle of a hurricane uh, we use radios here different types of radios some of them uh, are international radios like we used to call them shortwave at one time we bounce our signal off the ionosphere and it lands thousands of miles away just using enough power to power a light bulb, believe it or not. And then we gather eyewitness reports from these ham operators in the islands or on the Gulf Coast, uh, anywhere, and then we bring them in and give them to the hurricane forecasters. And sometimes that fills in those gaps that they can't get through satellites and air reconnaissance. So Julio hates Dr. Rick Nabb, it's good to see you. Now Julio and I go way back, okay, but Julio yeah, is a good friend. Yeah. And I want, to, I want everybody to understand where you're sitting, okay? You are right next to the Hurricane Reconnaissance Office and directly yeah. across the hallway from where the Hurricane Specialist sits. So I've had the experience of grabbing from you a piece of paper that has a ham radio report of an observation from an area that's been affected by the hurricane. We couldn't have got that observation any other way. Talk about how you work with the specialists down there. Yeah, basically that's what we do. Uh, just one example, for ex which you know very well, in 2005 Hurricane Adrian, we had a sailboat out in, near El Salvador. And that sailboat was sending us weather reports from their weather station on the sailboat there and there was no other surface data coming in at that time. And we would basically write all that down and sometimes we print it out uh, if they're digital, because we do have digital radios as well. And we bring them into the hurricane center uh, with all the forecasters there and all the hurricane specialists look at it and then they can tell you know, where that wind, what direction the wind was coming in, the barometric pressure, and that fills in those gaps. Yeah, and, and Julio is telling the story that I, I, that was from when I had to do the report on that system, and the only way I was able to actually accurately document what happened with that system in Central America was because of data through the ham radio operators that re relayed it. Now, talk about all the volunteers and the effort that you go through to train everybody and recruit those volunteers. Yeah, we have a staff of about 30 volunteers. They're all top grade ham radio operators, and we do bring them in and interview them. Uh, they have to have, you know, background checks and personal uh, references. And then we uh, bring them in and we take about uh, two or three days of a training session, which is not radio related because they know their radios before they come in. But basically how to gather the data, how to bring it down, how to filter some of the data, and then how to interact with the hurricane specialist. Julio, are there gaps that you'd like to fill, places where you maybe would like to have a little bit better coverage than you have now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we've had uh, some missing pieces, especially in the islands. We have good relationship with the ham radio operators in the island and some of their clubs. Uh, but what happens very often, like what happens here in Miami, uh, people batten down the hatches, bring down their towers, and then we don't hear from them. So we ask the ham operators in a hurricane affected areas to have backup power, whether it's battery or a generator, and to use wire antennas, because when we use those aluminum beam antennas that are excellent when we're doing regular operating, the wire antennas are very flexible, they flex in the wind and they don't break. Uh, and we've had, in fact, here at the Hurricane Center, we have seven ham radio antennas up there. And the two main ones we use, we call dipole antennas, they're actually wires that are about, 100, about 140 feet long from our 100-foot tower down to the building. And those withstood hurricanes like Wilma a few years ago, where we had winds here, I think they were up to about 110 miles per hour gusting up there, and they lasted easily. The wind goes right through it, they flex, and with those wires, we can talk all over the world. Yeah, so Julio, I was on the operations floor during Hurricane Wilma, and I remember that event very well, and I've told the story many times. Yes, the Hurricane Center's facility is a steel-reinforced concrete bunker, but communications are vulnerable, but how is it that 
the ham radio signal is going to be the one that might be the last one operating, even at the hurricane center if they're directly hit. Yeah, that happened uh, during Hurricane Fabian in Bermuda many years ago. Uh, they had no communications left over, you know, conventional communications. And I remember a reporter from a very famous reporter came in here. He heard us talking to Bermuda and he asked us how we're doing that. And I explained to him how we're bouncing the signals through the ionosphere. There's no wires connected between us and them. We send the signal up it, like a mirror. It bounces it back down to Earth. And uh, he says, but this is 100-year-old technology. You guys are dinosaurs. I said, OK, <laughs> fine. I said, well, you're in Bermuda in a hurricane. Go outside with your satellite phone and call me. And of course, then he realized, well, I really can't do that. I that said, well, these can't. These hands can. Great story. That is awesome. Hey, you might be a dinosaur, but you're not extinct. Hey, Julio, thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Yeah. Thank and you very much. Maybe a lot of people just don't know. Listen, this is, yes, uh, the ionosphere helping us communicate. Such dedicated okay. volunteers. So anyway, we may be dinosaurs, but we're not yet extinct. So why do we volunteer? We volunteer because we care volunteer many hours of our time. We learn, we practice our specialized skills. And this is why all of you are here today. And we appreciate all you do to help those during a hurricane. Um, you know, we, we never know how many lives we help save, but I'm sure that we help because if we weren't there, there would be no help for them. So thank you very much for your time today.